so welcome back. And now we're going to have some questions from the students from Gibbs High School. They're participating in our summer bridge during awesome. the summer, so they had a few questions about vaping for you. Thanks. It seems vaping is popular among today's society, and yet even though everyone does it, is it safe? Jonathan, thanks so much for participating in this video today, which I believe is going to help a lot of your fellow classmates and a lot more students in the fall and through the spring. It is very sad that vaping is becoming more popular every day. You are correct. No matter how we tell the students the dangers involved in getting uh, used to these sorts of habits, it hasn't seemed to make a difference. Uh, what you may not know is these companies who used to make all the cigarettes that lost tons of money when people finally realized how dangerous they were are responsible for the companies that are making your Juul cigarettes and all the other devices as well as that which goes inside them. And I think all those wonderful millions of advertising dollars are working their magic and teaching even kids in middle school that it's okay to start the vaping process. But the best part of the question is you asked, is it safe? And of course, it's completely unsafe. I think you know how dangerous cigarette smoking is, and now we know vaping is worse. First of all, it isn't regulated at all. There are so many chemicals inside the solution that's being aerosolized in all the different devices that there's not even possible a way to name all of them. Something that makes a smell, a taste, but most importantly, nicotine. That addictive compound that was in cigarettes, it made people want them for years. Nicotine is the primary component of those vaping fluids as well. And when people get a taste of nicotine, they want it again, no matter how it happens. So first of all, it's going to make you addicted to it. It's going to be dangerous for you because of the breathing aspect of it and the leading to lung cancer and all those other toxic effects. But also it's gonna be dangerous to all the other kids who are next to you breathing in that smoke as well. We'll talk about gateway drugs and you know that when kids start to do things like vape, it's only a matter of time when a large percentage of them will lead to stronger compounds, inhaled or injected or whatever it may be. If you have a question about this, I know it means that you know it's the wrong thing to do. But I hope the take home message to you is it is not safe. Don't start and do your best to find those who have started and make them stop because it can bring great health to all of us. Again, Jonathan, thanks so much for caring enough to participate and I hope I have been helped to you today. Yes. Uh, some of my friends are vaping and I just want to know how would it would affect me in the classroom or in sports and like what are the long term effects? Gabriel. I'm glad you asked that question and thank you so much for taking the time to do so. We don't know everything about all those compounds that are inside the vaping solution. But what I can tell you is this, one of them is nicotine. So it makes you addicting to wanting more and more of it all the time. But what does nicotine do besides causing you to be addicted? It acts on your brain in the neurosynapses to change the way connections are being made affecting your ability to think and to remember and to recall information on tests. Your brain is really not fully formed with all these synapses until you are 25 to 30 years of age. So vaping just once can have long-term complicants, uh, complications to your ability to learn, not just today or while the solution is inside your body, but tomorrow and down the road, even if you choose to not do it again. And then you're inhaling something that gets into your lungs and decreases your oxygen carrying capacity, the same way cigarettes do. And that's going to affect negatively your performance on the, the athletic fields and arenas, etc. The more you vape, the less you're going to be able to perform when you need oxygen. And most athletic activity is aerobic, needing oxygen. So you're going to make yourself unable to learn, unable to perform academically, and give yourself long-term complications for the rest of your life just by beginning to vape. But if you have, it's not too late to stop. Every time you inhale, you're going to cause more damage. And stopping today is going to pay you huge dividends tomorrow and in the future. Gabe, thanks so much for playing a role in this very important video today and I really appreciate you taking the time to ask. So I see a lot of my friends doing like vaping and juuling and e-cigarettes and all that. What are some of the side effects from not even doing it but from just being around it? Griffin, 
thank you very much for taking the time to speak on camera today about your concerns. We've talked about some issues regarding the dangers of he or she who does vape, but I want to talk to you about those who don't and those who are exposed. You know about secondhand smoke, and we've shown you in the past that that which comes out of the front end of a vaping device or cigarette is much more dangerous than that which is inhaled. And the same is true with vaping. Just standing near somebody who is doing so means you're inhaling those solutions that have nicotine that are going to make you addicted to wanting to start yourself. They're going to change the way your brain is forming connections, making it difficult for you to learn, to pay attention, to recall information on a test. Again, not just today or when you are in the presence of the vaping solution, aerosolized, but tomorrow and for the rest of your life. Every time you vape or stand near somebody who does, it's going to have long-term complications. And you're right. More and more people are vaping all the time. And it's a terrible tragedy. The reason is all the advertising dollars, <clears throat> all these companies who used to make cigarettes are now making Juul cigarettes and vaping solutions. And they're trying to convince you with their billions of dollars of revenue they're making from people starting every day that it's the cool and right thing to do. I hope you won't. But again, if you have already started to participate in this activity, it isn't too late to stop. And it also isn't too late to start hanging around people who are doing it. If your friends or acquaintances don't want to stop, now you know how dangerous it is to, dangerous it is to stand next to them. Walk away. Maybe your friendship is more important to them than what they are doing, and maybe you taking a stand will be the reason they will stop. And perhaps that is the epidemic we will see in the future the stopping of electronic cigarettes, the stopping of vaping, instead of the widespread starting. Thank you so much, Griffin. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, and I hope that my answers have helped you. Um, my name is Thomas, and I know a few of my friends are vaping a lot, so really my question is, is vaping a gateway to other drugs like marijuana or others? Hello, Thomas. Thanks for participating today. You've asked a very important question. And the answer is yes. We know that vaping can be a gateway to worse things. Because of the nicotine involved in that substance that's in all vaping solutions that makes you addicted to it, that changes the way your brain makes connections, making it difficult for you to learn and recall information, it also rewires your brain to have a desire and a thirst for other mind-altering substances. And of course, if you get used to inhaling vapor, People turn to cigarettes, and some skip that entirely and go right to marijuana. And then we know marijuana is a gateway drug to using much worse things, the injectable illicit drugs like heroin and et cetera, that are so rampant in our society today, even in kids who are in middle school. Because when people think they can get away with one thing, when people think that they can do one habit that's bad for them, like vaping, then they believe they can get away with anything. The omnipotence of adolescence, that fact that exists in all minds of kids your age, that the things they do today will not have any negative effect on their lives tomorrow, is so strong. And it is what leads people to start doing things like vaping and then moving to worse things. I can't tell you how many people I see in the hospital because they've used injectable drugs. And it leads them to death. It happens all the time. All of them have some history of doing things like vaping before. But I'm going to take that a step further and remind you of something. People often hide from what's going on in their lives by some recreational activity, like, like vaping. How about kids who are depressed and might even be suicidal and don't know how to talk to anybody about it? You know kids often turn to marijuana because they say it relaxes them. It hides their depression and anxiety. But people do the same thing with vaping although these unknown solutions can often make depression and anxiety worse. So maybe when you see somebody else turning to vaping, you might not worry about immediately what they might do in the future, but you might ask yourself, what was it that made them turn to vaping in the first place? And if you care enough about them, say something to somebody else or to them. And if you think there's something going on with some suicidal thoughts, depression or anxiety, help them. Say something to some authority at school or another friend or try to handle it with their parents. 
You know, kids are often afraid to get involved in the lives of their friends because they believe that they're being a narc or they're being a bad person. When the truth is, you might not understand or realize how many lives you might potentially be able to save throughout your time in middle school and high school. Care enough about people to make a difference. When you see people doing something wrong, step up. Find out why they're doing it and try to stop them, even if it means talking to authorities who could save their lives, because it could make a difference. Thomas, thanks so much for being here today. I appreciate your question, and I hope it will be a bit thought-provoking to you and those who are listening. And maybe it takes kids into a different journey than just beginning something so horrible for you as vaping is. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Seville. Really great advice about why are they starting vaping and could it possibly be linked to depression? Because we've connected with Sandy Hook Promise and they have the ability to see something, say something, mm -hmm. use that app to be able to anonymously tell someone, I think my friend needs help. And so being able to at least say to them, uh, I'm gonna let an adult know, yes. they're gonna check on you and I care about you. Yes. And that's, that's the key because the students are gonna know first uh, that there's an issue with a friend. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And when we come back, we're gonna talk about getting ready for the school year and that critical piece of getting those immunizations before Absolutely. the first day of school. All right, so thank you. <laughs> Hey guys, you just got finished watching my classroom using the smart board lesson that I created. Today I'm going to just talk to you about some tips and tricks. Um, one of the things that I want you guys to make sure that you are doing is that the smart board is really designed for one student at a time to use it. And it's a really great tool, however, the rest of your students are going to be sitting there not engaged in the lesson unless you have something planned to make sure that they are engaged. So one of the things that you saw my kids using was um, just a simple uh, plate and then um, a uh, dry erase marker and they use the marker and they're participating by writing on the plate and then using just a sock to erase it. Using the socks and the markers and the plates is a relatively quick and inexpensive trick for them to be engaged during the lesson. That's all for today's Tech Tips. You can watch for more on this channel. I'm Nicole Scalia. I'll see you next time. Seville is here. We're going to talk a little bit about going back to school, yeah. the things that families need to prepare for, but that critical piece of which immunizations they need to have. I know kindergarten is one group and preparing for seventh grade is another group. So speak to us a little bit about what parents should be going to see you or other pediatricians sure. for as they prepare to send their children to school. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. And let's be honest, immunizations have never been stronger <clears throat> in the news than they are now. Mm -hmm. We've warned people for years what would happen if people didn't choose to immunize, and we won't spend time talking about the famous people who've been against immunizations and those who have followed their ideas without any medical knowledge. Right. But we have people dying of measles in this state, people dying of measles in California, the unbelievable pocket of disease in upstate New York that has caused massive changes in the laws and the fact that you and I live in paradise. We live in a tourist area and so I had three cases of flu in my office today. Wow. So the point is there are illnesses all over the place but it is very important for parents to have a relationship with a physician that begins sometimes even before birth having a visit to a pediatrician before one decides where to go but that starts at birth and as soon as a baby goes home from the hospital. So if parents go to the recommended checkups quite frequently as infants, but every single year starting at age two for the rest of their lives, then this wouldn't become that much of an issue right. because you'd be going to the doctor every year, he or she would be telling you what is required and what is required for common sense, not just what's required for law. There are certain vaccines that can be given at 12 that ought to be given at 11 because you can have another year of protection against tetanus or uh, Neisseria meningitis, the worst bacterial meningitis. 
And the first thing a parents can do is be informed by finding a pediatrician or someone who takes care of their kids. They trust so they can go in there and make sure their kids are always up to date and never at risk for being unprotected. Thank you for that information. But let's talk a little bit specifically about what parents need to know, which immunizations to have for kindergarten all the way through. Absolutely. Well, you know, kids get uh, immunizations before VPK at age four, and they're the law to protect them against tetanus and measles, mumps, and rubella, and chicken pox, uh, because these sorts of diseases have become much more popular again because of those who don't vaccinate. And also, we have to remember, no vaccine is 100% effective. Vaccines at best are 93 to 94% effective. And so we always want to introduce the idea of herd immunity, H-E-R-D. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if you can immunize 91 to 96% of the population against a given disease, then it is sort of eradicated. Because you may have a kid who doesn't have immunity to a certain disease, even though you got the vaccine. Or some kids can't get the vaccine because they're being treated with chemotherapy because they have cancer or someone in the house does. Mm -hmm. But they'd still be protected because of the herd. And so that's why the immunizations are given uh, before kids go to school so you could protect kids in the classroom. I mean, we know how many teachers, of course, who have cancer and are still fighting that battle every day and come to school because they love children and the bravest people on the earth. Mm -hmm but their immune system is compromised. And what a terrible thing for a woman with breast cancer to still be teaching in the classroom because she doesn't want to take time off. Right. And she gets an incurable disease because her vaccines were no longer working because of chemotherapy. Okay. And somebody came to school who did not get protected because we say they had a religious exemption mm -hmm. and that teacher got sick, not from the cancer, but because of the disease. You know, we live in strange times. The schools have all these rules about not bringing peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You can't go in the classroom with a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because of the potential life-ending allergies that can happen from peanuts, but yet kids can go to school without immunizations for life-threatening diseases. I mean, we laugh about that, but the uh, fact is it's true. Uh, and then we have kids come from other countries and other places where the vaccines may not be fully up to date, or perhaps they were watered-down vaccines in other places. And then we move into kids in seventh grade. The truth is kids should receive the vaccine against meningitis, the menactra, the vaccine against uh, tetanus, uh, the Tdap vaccine, and pertussis or whooping cough. Mm -hmm. We had 83 children recently pass away, not far from where we are right now, of whooping cough as infants before they could be protected mm -hmm. because they were exposed to adults and older kids who weren't protected against that. But also a uh, Gardasil vaccine against cancer. We're seeing oral um, cancers in kids all the time right. because of HPV of the mouth. It has nothing to do with sexual activity. And yet people are often hesitant to get that vaccine. But having an open, honest conversation with the pediatrician or family practitioner who's caring for your children is important, but go there armed with your questions. And if you walk into the doctor's office and they just blow you off because they want you to do what they say and aren't willing to discuss it with you, well, maybe you're not in the right place. Right. Because after all, they're your kids. And I truly believe the majority of people who choose not to get immunizations really want the best things for their kids, but they've been given toxic information from Hollywood people or whatever it is. And if you would just take the time to speak to them, they would turn around and make the right decision. And there are others, of course, who just choose to believe that it's all a conspiracy. So because of that issue, it is your job as a parent who wants to get immunizations for kids to go to the doctor every year to make sure your kids are protected. So if someone's in the classroom who chooses not to, your kids won't be the ones who are at risk. Right. And I hope also that you'll take the time as a parent to speak out to your friends who might be questioning what to do and saying, listen, go talk to Dr. Gregor, go talk to some other pediatrician and make an informed decision. Because we are reaching a real critical period in this country's history where the diseases are starting to rear their ugly heads. We have polio in this country now. Right. We certainly have whooping cough. We know we have measles. We have kids still dying of chicken pox. And we have more and more cancer all the time and more and more people with compromised immune systems, not because of their fault, but because they're fighting the good fight right. against cancer with products that may save their life or lengthen it, but will certainly knock out their ability to fight common diseases. Why are we putting everyone's lives in so much risk? It's about having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great time to talk about it because you're gonna go off to VPK or kindergarten and get immunized. You're gonna get it at sixth or seventh grade. And then when kids come in for high school and they're going off to college, 
but uh, it's a time for a parent to talk to the pediatrician and make some great decisions which can have positive effects right. outside of the classroom. And I think parents that choose not to vaccinate don't realize that their child, if we have a measles outbreak, oh. just takes one, their child can't come to school anymore. Yeah. They have to stay away mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time and they're, they're feeling like, well, that's not fair. Why would my child be right. pulled down? Like, because of their own safety, we have to say, I'm sorry, your child can't come to school. Well, let's talk about something very fascinating mm -hmm. and not really controversial. Uh, recently, a law was changed in the state of Florida. It is true that when people choose not to vaccinate, they have to register. Again, people mm -hmm. often think the government is after them. But we do that, as you just said, because it protects their kids. Because a lot of people will choose to give a vaccination they didn't want to when there's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. However, the laws just changed that say people can opt out of that because they don't want Big Brother watching them. So now if a parent doesn't immunize, they're also allowed to opt out of reporting. So the health department doesn't know where to go to find the people whose lives are at risk during an epidemic. And this program here is not about the controversy going on in our government today. We hope that people are trying to make the best decisions. But again, it shows parents you can't rely on finding out which are the people who might be dangerous to you in the time of an epidemic because they may have their anonymity protected by current laws. So you have to immunize your kids to keep them as safe as possible. And we hope that people who are on the fence will have those conversations so that the percentage of population who choose not to immunize their kids for whatever reason right. will be so infinitesimally small that it will no longer be a burden to society itself. Really important information. Thank you so much again for being here with us, and we look forward to our next episode. Well, it's my honor to be with you, and I appreciate that this position exists. You're such a wonderful lady who goes out and talks uh, to the students, and I'm happy to be here in this studio where we all hope we're making a difference. That's how we got into the professions, right. is so that we can make a difference in the lives of kids. And I'm hoping that this moment here will be something kids will watch and bring home to their parents and a difference in life will be made. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing our next episode of Community Connections. I'm Warren Matway. Annenberg Media. According to Newton's laws, all objects in a gravitational field trace out conic sections. The precise shape of an orbit depends on the interplay between energy and eccentricity. All right, we're all set now to plunge in and see why trajectories in space follow the conic sections. But before we do, there's something curious I'd like to tell you about. The conic sections have not only mathematical properties, but also grammatical properties. 
That is, for each of the conic sections, there's a construction in the English language. For ellipse, there is ellipsis. For parabola, parable. And for hyperbola, hyperbole. Ellipsis means leaving something out of a sentence that can be understood. For example, when you say physics is more fun than chemistry, that's ellipsis, because what you should say is physics is more fun than chemistry is. <laughs> a parable is a story that's intended to teach us something, as in the story of Isaac and the apple. And hyperbole is an extravagant exaggeration, as when you say, this is the greatest physics course in the world. <laughs> it's really true that these words are related to the conic sections. You can find that out from any good dictionary, but nobody seems to know why. That's a mystery. But today I'd like to go into a much deeper mystery. I remember once, when I was old enough to know about the conic sections, but not yet old enough to know about Isaac Newton, I went to a show at the planetarium. And there was an exhibit there which said that the bodies that fly around in space, planets and meteors and, uh, and asteroids, follow trajectories which are either ellipses or parabolas or hyperbolas. And I remember being absolutely stunned by that. Why should those bodies fly around in courses which are curves having these special mathematical properties? Well, it is a breathtaking fact because it brings us face to face with that same mystery that has awed everyone from Galileo right up to Albert Einstein. Nature obeys mathematics. Today, our job is to do the mathematics that nature obeyed in designing the solar system. From a scientific viewpoint, the strategy for finding the ultimate secrets of the universe is for the most part still unknown. But scientists know that strategy has something to do with logic, with trial and error, with taking risks and going to the limit. If viewed in a certain light, not only the strategy but the universe itself may turn out to be some sort of cosmic game, a game that has been played for the highest stakes and for the longest time. Sometimes, playing conditions have been less than ideal. There's been war, poverty, and poor health. And there's been the threat of torture. But no matter the odds or the obstacles, there have been great players, scientists such as Kepler and Galileo, who, in order to satisfy themselves about the rules, have had to play the game. A game of serious consequences and profound implications, but like Star Wars, like a hand of five card stud, or a stick of eight ball, a game nonetheless. After all, human knowledge, like any number of games, evolves with increasing skill. And the rewards of science pay off in the currency of mathematics. Of course, not all games require genius. And certainly not all games require the genius of Galileo Galilei, even though he too was creative, inspired, and very competitive. For example, in a field along these lines when he was on a roll, Galileo had no competition. Perhaps that was because, at least on this level, it was the only game in town. Galileo rolled the ball hours on end. But it wasn't all play and no work. In fact, with just such a game, he was actually able to slow down falling motion. And locked in competition with nature itself, Galileo made some remarkable discoveries. For example, the distance fallen is proportional to the square of the time. Though all bodies, even his own, fall with the same constant acceleration, Galileo rose to make many other remarkable discoveries. In Europe, toward the end of the 16th century, another astronomer played with another collection of toys. His name was Tycho Brahe, 
and his playthings were sextants and quadrants of his own design and construction. Like Galileo with the inclined plane, the game Tycho played would reinterpret the rules that govern the universe. In fact, the strategy itself would be rewritten because in 1600, Johannes Kepler sat down to play. At this game, and especially in Tycho Brahe, Kepler met his match. But after almost two years, a little luck finally came Kepler's way. That luck, in the form of Tycho's heavenly observations, kept Kepler at the table almost three decades. The game was never easy to begin with, and in some ways, the longer he played, the more complicated it got. But by the end, Johannes Kepler had won his final round of cosmic mathematics. The victory became known as Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. The law of ellipses. The law of equal areas. And the law of harmony. Isaac Newton would polish these laws to perfection. In his mind, Kepler was a giant, and he realized those three laws were correct. Newton imagined Galileo as a giant as well, and saw that his law of falling bodies was likewise correct. But in science, as well as history, timing is everything. And it took Newton's era and Newton's genius to explain why they're correct. He explained the laws of both Galileo and Kepler by deducing them from his own laws, the laws of gravity and motion. Because of those laws, the equation of the Earth's orbit is that of a conic section, and in particular, an ellipse. This is one of the underlying mathematical patterns of the universe. Planets move in ellipses determined by the angular momentum. The mass of the planet, the mass of the sun, and the eccentricity of the orbit. But Newton's solution doesn't say that the orbit of every heavenly body must be elliptic. It can be a parabola or a hyperbola or even a perfectly platonic circle. Is this really the shape of things in the heavens? And if so, what determines the precise shape of a body's orbit? All conic sections do appear in the heavens. And the key to the precise shape is to be found in the energy of the body. Picture what happens to that energy as a planet zips around its orbit. When the planet falls close to the sun, its potential energy is low. But the planet speeds up, so the kinetic energy becomes high. At the outer reach of the ellipse, with its low kinetic energy, the planet sort of loafs along. At the same time, because of the greater distance from the sun, its potential energy is high. In other words, the potential energy and kinetic energy of the planet keep trading back and forth. Like the potential and kinetic energy of a swinging pendulum, one goes up, the other goes down. However, because the planet moves in a vacuum with no drag, the total energy does not change. And this total energy is the key to the shape of the orbit. The quest to find the shapes of orbits was undertaken long before Kepler's attempt. Ptolemy sighted the stars with a small quadrant, and such instruments have enhanced astronomical observations for centuries. With the help of Urania, the muse of astronomy, 
Ptolemy saw to the limits of his vision and imagination alike. Later, Tycho Brahe called his island observatory Uraniborg, named after the same muse. At Uraniborg, Tycho built stargazing gadgets that were beyond compare before the invention of the telescope. Tycho's brilliance in seeing afar was only outdistanced by his vanity. Fancying himself a scientist king, in one sweeping gesture, Tycho pointed out his kingdom, which took in nothing less than all of heaven itself. With instruments almost as strong as his sense of self-worth, Tycho was head and shoulders above all the other astronomers on Earth. His two minutes of arc, which is equivalent to about one-fifteenth of the diameter of the moon as seen from the Earth, was five times more accurate than any measurement in history. Only after 1609, the year Galileo looked through his telescope, did astronomical vision improve to any degree. It's improved considerably. By means of radio telescopes, accuracy has increased to one thousandth of one second of arc. In human perspective, that's about the width of a hair, seen at a distance of 10 kilometers. Featuring both power and precision, modern telescopes are able to see countless objects that before now could be seen only in the astronomer's dreams. For instance, Pluto, though invisible to the naked eye, stands out clearly in these photographs. Trying to explain irregularities in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, an astronomer named Percival Lowell predicted Pluto's dreamlike existence before its visual reality came true. Later, Clyde Tombaugh searched hundreds of photographs for one tiny little blip moving amidst the fixed stars. And when he found it, he found Pluto. And when he found Pluto, he found a rather eccentric ellipse. It actually crosses inside the orbit of Neptune. Halley's Comet, discovered by Newton's friend Edmund Halley, has an elliptical orbit that's even more eccentric. These orbits are in marked contrast to those of Venus and the Earth, which go around the Sun in very nearly circular fashion. But all of them, elliptic or almost round, are paths of constant energy. This fact is nothing less than a mathematical miracle. Behold a planet, moving in an ellipse, sweeping out equal areas in equal times. It has kinetic energy and potential energy. At any point in the orbit, the total energy is the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy. First, calculate the potential energy. Potential energy follows a cosine curve. Now, calculate the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy follows another cosine curve. The total energy, kinetic plus potential, is constant. That's because the cosine terms cancel in the addition. And 
that's it. The connection between energy and eccentricity. It's true for a hyperbola, a parabola, or an ellipse. Of course, Johannes Kepler's discovery that the planetary orbits are elliptical wasn't made on the basis of telescopic observations. Even before the existence of the most elementary telescope, Kepler made his discoveries based on totally human observations. And those eyes and observations alike had belonged to Tycho Brahe. By the time he met Kepler, Tycho had recorded 777 stars, considering all the stars in heaven that may not seem like many. But as Johannes Kepler knew, it was the sum total of all the naked eye could see. When Kepler asked to take a look at the data, Tycho told him to take a walk. Tycho considered the serious-minded Kepler as somewhat of a plaything. was designed as cleverly as his instruments, was Tycho's version of Follow the Leader, which Kepler couldn't begin to play without the observations. But eventually, as fate would have it, the tables turned. On his deathbed, Tycho Brahe would have a change of heart. As his dying wish, he begged Kepler to take his data, to use it well, and to conclude the most serious game of their lives. Almost 30 years later, Kepler finally managed to get Tycho's data published, but not before he had used those data to discover the shape of Mars' orbit. The shapes of orbits depend on their energies. For a given angular momentum, the energy determines the eccentricity, and the eccentricity determines the orbit. The ellipse. When the total energy is negative and the eccentricity is less than one, the orbit is an ellipse. Positive kinetic energy is too small to overcome the negative potential energy. Therefore, trapped in a closed orbit, the body can never escape the solar system. The parabola. When the total energy is zero, and the eccentricity is exactly one, the orbit is a parabola. If a body started with zero kinetic energy and fell from infinity, it would whip once around the sun and return to infinity. It's highly unlikely that positive kinetic energy and negative potential energy would exactly balance this way, but it's possible. the hyperbola. When the total energy is positive and the eccentricity is greater than one, the orbit is a hyperbola. If an object were shot toward the sun from very far away, its positive kinetic energy would overcome its negative potential energy. Some comets have hyperbolic orbits. The circle. If the energy has a special value, the eccentricity is zero. And the orbit is a perfect circle. This is the lowest energy a planet can have for a given angular momentum. The rings of Saturn, for all their beauty, are nothing more than a pile of evolving junk cosmic scraps that have rubbed together for a billion years. And as a result of all this brushing and bruising, their orbits were chipped encounter by encounter into nice, smooth circles.
that's known to be true, just because of the relation between energy and eccentricity. Even though computing a million interacting orbits is beyond the mathematical capability of the most powerful computers on Earth. To the degree that modern astronomy is effective, it owes its effectiveness to the invention of the reflector telescope. The mirror of this one has been ground and polished to tolerances that are measured in thousandths of a centimeter. Such accuracy wasn't always possible, but the principle was nearly always the same. To focus the light properly, the reflecting mirror must be ground in the shape of a parabola. The grinding requires skill, patience, and most important, a compound of messy, mud-like lens grinding polish. The first man to complete this task, it was a messy job, but somebody had to do it, was rewarded with an invitation to join the Royal Society. His name was Isaac Newton, and it was the reflecting telescope, not his other discoveries, that first made him famous. A fame that, like the parabolic mirror, endures and evolves. Today's giant telescope, and this is no small wonder, is an extension of Newton's principle. But again, human exploration into space, the grandest game in the solar system, didn't begin with Sir Isaac Newton. There were, after all, those shoulders upon which he stood to play. Galileo and his toys, the stuff of which the law of falling bodies was made. Tycho and his observations, pieces of a puzzle that changed the course of cosmic history. Kepler, who played with Tycho's observations in the most clever and calculating manner, and who in the end rewrote the rules. Of course, while the game didn't begin with Newton's genius, neither did it end there. Modern scientists, like Newton before them, take their turns at trying to unlock the cosmos. It's still a fantastic and ongoing game in which now the best players see 15 billion years into the past. And the answer, the winner's prize, is a peek at the very origin of the universe. So the question is, who's up next? As I told you before, the first to know what Newton had done was his young friend, Edmund Halley. Halley realized that according to Newton, although the orbits of the planets happened to be very nearly circular, it was also possible for a body to have a very eccentric elliptical orbit like this. If there were such a body, it would be sighted by us, and then it would go far, far away for many years before it came back to be sighted again. So he consulted the historical record, and he found sightings in 1531 and 1607, and again in 1682, that were so nearly identical that they had to be the same object. That, of course, was Halley's Comet. But the critical test was to predict when it would be seen again. And he did. Unfortunately, in order to find out whether he was right, he would have had to live to be 102. And he didn't make it. He only lived to be 86. Nevertheless, just as predicted, on Christmas Day of 1758, Halley's Comet was spotted once again. As I'm sure you know, its most recent round trip brings it by us in 1910 and again in 1986. So that's it. We've explained the structure of the heavens, that mystery from time out of mind has finally been solved. Many years ago, there was something called the Pythagorean Brotherhood. They were followers of the master Pythagoras of Samos. It was a semi-mystical mathematical priesthood. Neophytes would have to go through a long and difficult apprenticeship to purify the mind and cleanse the soul before they could be entrusted with the awesome power of mathematical knowledge. Well, today, after a long and difficult apprenticeship, you have been permitted to peek into the inner temple of human knowledge. I hope you'll use that power wisely. 
but right now, you can get out of here. The eccentricity of an orbit depends on the energy of the moving body. Negative energy means an elliptical orbit. When the total energy is zero, the orbit is a parabola. When the total energy is positive, the orbit is hyperbolic. Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org. Hi, I'm RJ Brown with more science news you can use. How does NASA study Earth from space? With satellites? You're so smart. Satellites see Earth in ways our eyes can't. How can satellites do that? The aqua satellite sees how much heat comes from the Earth's surface. This can tell us the ocean's temperature. What about other satellites? The Terra satellite watches sand from African dust storms moving across the ocean. How does it do that? The Terra satellite measures how much sunlight reflects off the dust particles. This sand can affect sea life and coral reefs. I'm glad scientists can use NASA satellites to help us understand how the Earth works. You can check out our website for more about satellites. Until next time, I'm RJ with more cool science news you can use. Annenberg Media. Voyages to other planets require enormous energy. The amount of energy expended can be minimized by using the same force that moves the planets through the solar system. The force of the sun's gravitational field is used to navigate in space. A few years ago, the only conceivable purpose for all of the beautiful celestial mechanics we've been teaching you would have been to plot the courses of the planets in the sky. But that's no longer true. Today, many of the objects up there were put up there, either by us 
or by our friends on the other side of this tiny planet we inhabit. And in a few years, if we manage not to blow each other up, there are sure to be many more. The routes followed by spacecraft and artificial satellites are governed by exactly the same rules that govern the orbits of the planets. And so, if someday somebody comes tooling up to you, opens the window of a spacecraft and says, hey buddy, how do I get to Venus from here? I want you to know what to answer. You'll say, I'll draw you a map. to Venus and Mercury. An exquisite vessel, a scientific explorer launched across the solar sea. Viking, 1975, to Mars. Another mechanical marvel launched in search of answers. Answers that may return to haunt long-held theories. Answers to such questions as what was the biological spark that ignited the human species? Voyager, 1977. To Jupiter and to Saturn. To Uranus and to Neptune. Mariner. Viking and Voyager. This century's Francis Drake, Ferdinand Magellan, Eric the Red, launched to discover how the planets were created. First-hand answers may turn current matters of fact into historical chapters of science fiction, or they may do just the opposite. But whatever the answers from outer space, first come the questions on Earth. Questions beginning with in search of the unknown, how do they reach beyond the known? Without even the aid of a lighthouse, how can a modern mariner or any other space-age vessel sail from here to there? And once launched into the cosmic seas, who navigates? Caltex Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, Pasadena, California. Nerve Center for Exploration into the Endless Frontier of Space. The cerebral cortex of NASA's unmanned planetary program. The Deep Space Network Operations Center. There are countless problem solvers in the space age, but only a few are qualified to solve problems in outer space itself. One age-old problem of outer space has to do with getting there. I suppose it would be possible to fly a spacecraft on a straight line from one point to another in the solar system. It would require an exorbitant amount of propulsive capability. It surely is not the best way to do it. In fact, in flying from one place to another in the solar system, we use one of Kepler's laws, which tells us that the planets move around the sun on ellipses, and the spacecraft will follow exactly these, these same laws. Ignition. Obviously, to aim toward the planets with brute force alone is to miss the point entirely. Clearly, present-day space navigators look to the future by way of the past. Kepler's three laws stated how the planets orbit the sun. Newton explained why Kepler's laws work. Now, no matter how futuristic the problems, space navigators use Newton's and Kepler's laws as operating principles. The way we get a spacecraft from Earth to Mars is to put the spacecraft in an independent orbit around the sun that necessarily intersects the orbit of Earth and the orbit of Mars. In fact, the launch vehicle has to impart enough speed to that spacecraft right after launch so that it will coast all the way from Earth to Mars once the launch vehicle burns out 30 minutes after liftoff. To travel between two points in space, 
a craft coasts to its destination in orbit around the sun, just as if it were an orbiting planet. The path of a spacecraft from one planet to another is called a transfer orbit. For the Viking mission, we were quite limited in selecting the transfer orbit because Viking was the most massive interplanetary spacecraft ever launched. The then most powerful launch vehicle, the Titan Centaur, could just barely get us to Mars. The classical transfer between two planets is referred to as the Hohmann transfer. We followed a transfer very close to this. It's one in which we launch from Earth tangentially at the lowest point in the orbit, that is the point closest to the sun, and arrive at Mars at the highest point, the apoapsis point, the most distant point from the sun. So we have an orbit that just manages to connect from the Earth's orbit to Mars' orbit. In fact, the spacecraft does one half a revolution in this orbit to make the transfer. Getting there may be half the fun, but the trip can't just start any old time. No matter how elaborate the preparations, the whole crew has to wait until it's time for launch. The problem of getting a spacecraft from one point to another in the solar system is rather like shooting at a moving target with a rifle. There are two parts to the problem. You have to be sure that the target is within range, and you have to establish the amount by which you're going to lead the target so that it doesn't pass you before you get there. Just as Kepler's third law fixes the length of an Earth year. And the length of a Mars year. It also dictates how long a spacecraft, coasting in an orbit of its own, will take to get from the Earth to the position of the orbit of Mars. It takes about eight and a half months. In order for Mars to be waiting when the craft arrives, it has to be launched when Mars is just 44 degrees ahead of the Earth. That alignment is called an opportunity. In the planetary problem, we have to wait to get the planetary alignment to be just right and within the limits of our launch vehicle capability. When the alignment is correct, we have what is referred to as an opportunity, and this is when we can launch. Typically, these opportunities have a duration of one to two weeks. Space navigators must wait for just the right moment, when a coasting orbit will take the spacecraft from the position of the Earth to the orbit of the target planet, just when the target planet arrives there. That moment is called an opportunity. opportunity doesn't knock at the same time for all planets. Prospects look good for Mars about every two years. opportunity to visit Venus presents itself every 19 months. And for Jupiter, each 13 months. When these times come, space navigators must be ready to move to move quickly through a launch window. A few fleeting moments each day when the rockets must actually be fired. For each day, there is a fairly restricted time within which we could launch. This problem is quite similar to one where 
you might be riding on a carousel and playing catch with a friend standing off to the side. For each revolution of the carousel, you'd have a fairly short range of time where you could see your friend and could throw the ball to him. On our revolving carousel called Earth, the problem is very similar. Each time that the Earth comes around, we have an alignment between the launch site and the direction in which we need to depart from Earth. So the, mad, the problem is one of waiting until we get this alignment and then we launch. The carousel called Earth is itself in a nearly circular orbit around the sun. Any increase or boost in speed creates a bigger, more eccentric orbit. To go from an Earth orbit into a Mars transfer orbit requires a boost of exactly 2.9 kilometers per second. But the first task is to escape from the parking orbit around the Earth. A rocket thrust will boost the craft into a hyperbola that drifts to infinity at just the right speed of 2.9 kilometers per second. And the thrust must come at just the right moment. That moment is 7.56 p.m. local time. The sun does the rest of the job, bending the trajectory into a Mars transfer orbit. If the destination is Venus rather than Mars, the basic idea is the same. But now the journey is inward, toward the sun. Blasting off in the morning at 7.40 a.m., the craft escapes from the Earth but this time, it's going backward relative to the Earth's orbit, losing speed and falling inward toward Venus. So, if someday someone does open the window of his spacecraft and ask you, Hey, buddy, how do I get to Venus from here? Now you know what to tell them. Getting the craft into the planet's vicinity, making the orbits intersect, is only part of the space navigator's challenge. The object, after all, is to land the craft. In preparation to land Viking, an earlier mission, Mariner 9, took photographs to stake a visual claim on Mars. With preparations completed, Viking is ready to land. But Viking's cameras reveal a sight that's surprisingly and dangerously laden with boulders. Fortunately, Viking has the ability to scout another landing site. But finding a safe site is one thing, actually landing safely quite another. One false calculation, which is easy to imagine at a distance of 200 million kilometers, could add up to the destruction of Viking. But the pre-programmed computer on board Viking saves the day, to say nothing of the craft itself. So for the first time, the planet Mars is photographed from its own surface. Newton and Kepler might have fantasized about setting some sort of scientific gadget atop a distant planet, but it took JPL's scientists to do it. Scientists and engineers by nature don't tend to rest on their accomplishments. The space navigators set their sights not only on Mars, but on an enormous journey to the four outer giants of the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In this case, timing is everything because these planets line up right. That is, right for one spacecraft to visit all four in the same trip, just once every 175 years. 
That 175-year cycle came around in 1977. In that year, not one, but two fragile vessels set forth on a journey that would take them to the giant planet Jupiter. Then through the rings of Saturn. One of them would even pass by mysterious Uranus. Even beyond distant Neptune. And finally, both would coast into the endless reaches of interstellar space. make the trip meant first of all overcoming gravity just to escape from the planet earth but even then and even given the grand once in a hundred and seventy five year opportunity it still couldn't have been done without the help of gravity itself the principle of gravity assist is really pretty simple what we do is we use the gravity of a planet to change the speed and direction of flight of a spacecraft as it goes past the planet now of course when I say change of speed and direction, I mean really with reference to the sun. From the point of view of the planet, uh, nothing much happens. A spacecraft is out here approaching with a certain speed. It speeds up, whips around, and leaves. Same speed leaving as it had coming in. But from the point of view of the sun, it's quite different. Both Voyager missions got their first gravity assist from the planet Jupiter, propelling them onward toward Saturn. But to appreciate the concept, it's not necessary to go quite that far. You might think of it this way. Suppose we imagine a baseball game. Here's a batter, and he's going to bunt. So he holds the bat absolutely still. The pitch comes in, bounces off the bat, and down onto the turf and rolls away. The only thing that the baseball bat has done in this interaction is change the direction of flight of the baseball. It hasn't added any energy to it. But if the, if the batter's swinging, the bat is moving. The bat has energy. When the bat hits the ball now, it adds quite a bit of energy to it, and in fact, enough to get over the fence and be a home run. It's the combination of the energy which the pitcher gave to the ball and the extra energy the ball got from the swinging bat that is now enough to carry it over the center field wall. Of course, uh, like most analogies, this one isn't perfect. The uh, a spacecraft doesn't bounce off a planet like the ball off of the bat. The spacecraft approaches the planet, and it's the gravitational pull of the planet that causes this interaction. It's not a physical contact. If Jupiter really did hit Voyager, that would be the ballgame. While there's no physical contact, however, there is a striking connection between baseball and physics. Jupiter doesn't stand still. It moves. And like a swinging bat, it gives up some of its energy to the ball of Voyager as it flies by. Playing on the largest field around, the universe itself, space navigators hurled Voyager past Saturn and her fabled rings. And there, like mighty Casey at the bat, they came up against the unexpected. The rings are, are actually a countless number of small bodies in orbit around Saturn. One of the surprises that we found, for instance, was that the two brightest rings, the A and the B ring, which can be seen from Earth and look rather smooth and homogeneous, when viewed up close, appear to be quite structured. Perhaps the most intriguing surprise, though, uh, was that associated with the narrow F ring, which is just outside of the A ring. The F ring was actually discovered in 1979 by the Pioneer 11 flyby. It's a very narrow ring of particles orbiting Saturn. We discovered with Voyager 1 a key, uh, an essential key to understanding the dynamics of such a narrow ring. We found two satellites orbiting Saturn, one just inside the F ring and one just outside the F ring. 
The key to the mysterious F-ring turned out to be the same principle that had gotten Voyager there to see it, the principle of gravity assist. The F-ring and its shepherding moons are all in orbit around Saturn. Obeying Kepler's third law, the inner moon moves fastest, the ring material slower, and the outer moon slower still. When a ring particle encounters the faster moving inner moon, the moon pulls it along, speeding the particle up and flinging it into a higher orbit. When a ring particle encounters the slower moving outer moon, the particle gets held back, slows down, and falls into a lower orbit. These effects, together with collisions among the ring particles themselves, shepherd the material between the moons into a narrow ring. While this kind of motion was somewhat unexpected, its discovery wasn't a total surprise. Shepherding was offered as a theory before Voyager encountered Saturn to explain the rings of another planet. When the shepherding theory was first proposed as an explanation for the narrow rings around Uranus, it was not universally acclaimed because it was an uneconomical theory. That is, that it required the presence of two unseen objects, two small moons, to explain the presence of one object, a narrow ring, which had been observed. I think the first direct evidence that such a, that such a shepherding effect took place was with Voyager. Uh, I think it was a surprise to, uh, to many. It wasn't a surprise to those who believed in the theory. Today, shepherding and gravity assist combine to illustrate that 300 years after the discovery of classical mechanics, there are still new discoveries to be made. Celestial scientists, from Johannes Kepler onward, could calculate the motions of the solar system. And any great scientist who understood the orbits of the planets held within his grasp a profound and truly heavenly knowledge. But for 300 years, even to the greatest minds, the heavens remained within reach of the intellect alone. Three centuries would pass before the first hesitant steps beyond the barrier of Earth's gravity were taken, to finally allow scientists to take part in, rather than observe from afar, the worlds beyond the planet Earth. Navigating as well as calculating, making heaven passable as well as possible, that is the miracle of the space age. That's what the father of classical mechanics might have dreamed of. But that is what the space navigators made reality. magnificent discoveries of the Voyager mission, one of the most unexpected and spectacular was the complexity of the rings of Saturn. When this discovery was made, scientists all over the world went scrambling around trying to find an explanation. And so far as I know, no one has succeeded. Well, I have a theory of the rings of Saturn. You can call this the Gutstein theory. <laughs> But I haven't published it yet in a scientific journal, so you'll have to promise not to tell anyone, OK? First, let me remind you that the Voyager spacecraft, like the Pioneer 10 before it, is going to escape from the solar system and drift forever in the endless reaches of space. Now, there's just the tiniest chance that someday someone or something from an alien civilization will come across one of those craft. And just in case that happens, we've put on each craft a message from us to them. On the Voyager craft, among other things, the message has a phonograph record. It has music and samples from various languages and a greeting from President Carter <laughs> and a number of other things that an alien civilization just couldn't do without. But the main point is this. We assume that if an intelligent being 
ventures into space and finds a flat disk with a lot of grooves in it, that they'll know exactly what it is and what to do with it. Well, the rings of Saturn are a flat disk with a lot of grooves in it. Oh. <laughs> On second thought, I think I'll keep my theory to myself. I'll see you next time. To navigate from the Earth to another planet, a spacecraft is launched into a transfer orbit. The launch must occur in a brief window during a special opportunity for each planet. Navigators also use gravity assists from the planets themselves to provide additional boosts. Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org. I believe the way I instill drive in my students is to help them to get to know who they are themselves. Um, in civics, I instill a sense of passion about being Americans, about loving their country. I want them to at least learn about it and then develop their own sense of pride that we are part of a great democracy and that to make it even better, they have to participate in it, learn as much as they can about it. My choice, my Pinellas County Schools. periods of the planets in their orbits, the ebb and flow of the tides, the acceleration of a falling body. All these phenomena are consequences of the force of gravity, and they've inspired the labor of scientists from Kepler to Einstein. Well, we've almost come to the end of our story. Today I have just a few loose ends I'd like to tie up. The first one is Kepler's third law. 
That will bring us to the end of the Kepler problem. Then there's the question of the tides. You remember, Galileo had a theory of the tides which he considered to be the crowning achievement of his career because it proved that Copernicus had to be right. But Galileo was completely wrong. Today I'll explain to you how the tides really work. And then finally, I'd like to return to the very first thing we did, the law of falling bodies. Gravity applies a different force to each body in just such a way that they all fall at exactly the same rate. It seemed to Albert Einstein that there ought to be a profound reason for that to be true. And in searching for that reason, he discovered nothing less than a new theory of the universe. So, those are our loose ends for today. I think we'd better get started. Galileo Galilei was a mathematician who wrote a popular book that got him into a lot of trouble. 250 years later, Charles Lutwidge Dodson, another mathematician, wrote another popular book. Dodson's mathematics was as respectable as the Victorian era in which it was published and almost as forgotten. Yet like Galileo, he may be remembered forever, but only under his pen name, Lewis Carroll, and only as long as children appreciate the wisdom of pure nonsense. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Lewis Carroll wrote through the looking glass for a child named Alice. He could have had Galileo's curious situation in mind. For one thing, since Galileo used logic when the issue was basically religious, he might as well have debated the Mad Hatter. Pure faith and pure science have never been the same thing. So naturally, when church scholars peered into Galileo's telescope, they looked through the glass darkly. And in Galileo's persistent defense of Copernicus, they began to see what looked like heresy. Of course, this serious charge had nothing to do with the fantasy walrus or whether pigs have wings. But it did have something to do with why the boiling sea has tides. To Galileo, the tides were more than the ebb and flow of the Earth's oceans. They were his evidence that the Earth really moves. Tides exist because of the Earth's motion around the sun, he argued, and he worked out a detailed theory of exactly how the tides were caused. Galileo considered his theory of the tides to be the high point of his scientific career. But if he had been right, there would be only one high tide each day, and it would occur at high noon. The sad truth is, Galileo's tide theory was really all wet. The tides do rise, and they recede as well. But as anyone can see with a bit of patient observation, they do so twice every day. To understand why the tides behave this way, it helps to take the long view. In the Earth-Moon system, the Earth and the Moon rotate around a common center of mass. That point is actually inside the Earth, about three quarters of the distance from the Earth's center to its surface. The strange wobbling motion of the Earth, seen from this perspective, is really a Keplerian orbit of the center of the Earth around the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system. But only the center of the Earth is in exactly the right orbit. On the side closest to the Moon, the Moon's gravity is too strong, and the water there is pooled toward the Moon into a bulge. On the opposite side, the moon's gravity is too weak to hold the water in place. And so there too, the water bulges outward, trying to escape. As the Earth wobbles around the Earth-Moon center of mass, it also rotates on its axis. And as the Earth rotates, it passes beneath the bulges. At those locations where the rotating Earth passes under the rising water, high tides occur. And at the points between, low tides occur. Two high tides and two low tides every day. 
And every day as well, the sun plays a role in the ongoing drama of the tides. Since the sun's gravity tugs at the earth like the moon's, it contributes to the tides in the same way. Though the sun's larger, its effect on the tides is about half that of the moon, because it's so much farther away from the earth. At full moon and at new moon, earth, the sun, and the moon fall into a straight line. Then the tidal effects of sun and moon reinforce each other and create the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. High and low, the tides rise and fall because the earth moves. In writing his theory, Galileo was not wrong in raising his pen in defense of Copernicus. It was a lonely battle, but at least in principle, he was not alone. In 1618, Two years after the church warned Galileo to stop teaching such dangerous ideas, Johannes Kepler published a book called Harmony of the Worlds. More than an argument for the truth of Copernicus, this book was Kepler's proof that he himself had not lived a lie. Kepler not only attempted to unwrap and expose the secrets of the universe, he tried to tie up and explain them all, all in one book, and with one all-encompassing synthesis of geometry, music, and astronomy. No work since Plato's in the Golden Age could match the ambitious nature of Kepler's harmony of the worlds. And when Newton dug into Kepler's ideas, he found mathematical treasures of invaluable worth. It might have been tedious to sift through music that couldn't be heard, fantasies that made little sense, and planetary models that made less. But how rewarding it must have been to unearth Kepler's three laws. According to Newton, Kepler's first law said that the orbits of the planets are ellipses. Kepler's second stated that the radius vector of a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. And finally, Kepler's third law. The square of any planet's period is proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. But why? Integrating Kepler's second law through one complete period shows that the period of a planet is proportional to the area of its orbit, but also goes inversely as the angular momentum divided by the mass. This relation is true of many kinds of motion. For example, it would be true if the solar system rotated like a solid body, with all the planets having the same period. It would also be true if the solar system swirled like a vortex, with every planet having the same angular momentum divided by mass. Then the period of each planet would be proportional to the square of the size of its orbit. And it's also true for the real motion of the planets. This motion, produced and directed by Isaac Newton's law of universal gravitation, features an elliptical orbit whose size depends on L over M. And so, in the end, 4 pi squared, the gravitational constant, and the mass of the sun connect t squared to a cubed for every planet. 
Kepler's third law relates the periods of the planets to the size of their orbits. And the connection is simple, elegant, and altogether profound. Of course, the history of science can be seen as a series of such insightful connections. The risky connection between a revolutionary Copernican idea and Galileo's theory of the tides. The connection among the rising moon, the rising sun, and the rising tides on Earth. The connection of all three linked and locked in eternal orbit. The connection between the orbits of all the planets and Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. The connection between Kepler's laws, which explain how the planets behave, and Newton's laws, which explain why. And finally, from Galileo's law of falling bodies to Kepler's third law, to Newton's mechanics and his universal law of gravitation, the connection explained the mechanical universe. But a few rare things in the universe seem to go beyond even Newton's explanation and seem to require a change not only in the nature of gravity, but even in the meaning of space and time. To Albert Einstein, the enigma of gravity time and space was of no small consequence. It was a puzzle that promised enormous challenge, and if solved, the answer to perhaps some of the deepest mysteries in the cosmos. Like Newton before him, Einstein began with the law of falling bodies. Galileo didn't quite understand gravity. No one really would until Newton. But he discovered the fact that all bodies fall with the same constant acceleration. Why should the force of gravity lead to such a strange result? When calculating the acceleration of a falling apple, the mass cancels out, leaving the same acceleration for any falling body. But why should that be the case? In F equals MA, the mass determines how much force is needed to produce a given acceleration. In other words, the mass determines how strongly a body resists changing its inertia. This property of a body has nothing to do with gravity. It's called the inertial mass. On the other hand, in the law of gravity, the mass determines how strongly a body attracts every other body in the universe. This property has nothing to do with inertia. It's called the gravitational mass. Isaac Newton understood that the law of falling bodies meant these two completely different masses had to be exactly the same for every body in the universe. But why? Why is gravitational mass always equal to inertial mass? Could that be some cosmic coincidence? Scientists, as a rule, don't place much stock in phenomena that can be explained by mere coincidence. Albert Einstein placed none. He believed there must be some more profound law of nature that would make the law of falling bodies not a mystery, but instead something so simple it would be perfectly obvious. And the principle he chose became the basis for his general theory of relativity. It's called the principle of equivalence. Equivalence, that is, between constant gravity and constant acceleration. Imagine an experiment in which different objects with different masses all fall with exactly the same acceleration, called g. That might happen because the laboratory is on the surface of the Earth. But the same thing would also happen if the laboratory were far from Earth and everything else, say in intergalactic space. It would happen if the laboratory were accelerating upward with acceleration g. All the objects inside, obeying the law of inertia, would not accelerate. But they would all seem to fall with the same constant acceleration. Albert Einstein understood that the law of falling bodies and the mysterious equality of gravitational mass and inertial mass 
would be perfectly explained if the following fundamental principle were true. No experiment of any kind done entirely inside that laboratory could determine whether the objects fall because of the pool of gravity or because the laboratory is accelerating upwards in outer space. The idea seems almost too simple to be true, but Albert Einstein didn't take it lightly. Instead, he asked how the experiment would come out if it were performed with a beam of light. With the laboratory out in space, the answer was easy to see. If the rocket accelerates upward while the beam goes straight across, it must seem to bend downwards just a tiny bit. But then what would happen on Earth? The answer comes from the principle itself. Since no experiment, not even this one, can tell whether the laboratory is on Earth or in space, the result must be exactly the same. In other words, Einstein concluded that light doesn't travel in straight lines. Instead, it bends ever so slightly because of the gravitational force of the Earth. Einstein predicted light would likewise bend as it passed the sun. And when he said so in this letter to George Ellery Hale, it looked extremely good on paper. But not quite good enough for astronomers to risk their precious telescopes, much less their precious eyesight looking directly at the sun. And so, George Ellery Hale, Einstein's correspondent, and himself one of the great astronomers of the early 20th century, made a gentle suggestion. Why not observe the sun during an eclipse? And in 1919, that's precisely what Sir Arthur Eddington and his party of solar explorers went out and did. The triumphant success of that expedition was the first great proof of relativity and turned the quiet, shy Albert Einstein into an instant, world-famous folk hero. Everyone knew about him, even though few could understand relativity. And no one really knows why the world took Einstein to its heart. Probably, exhausted by World War I, people needed a hero. His discovery was benign, and Albert Einstein looked like everyone's favorite uncle. He also became the symbol for all scientists, and it didn't make any difference that few could understand Einstein's great work. The principle of equivalence raises an interesting question. If light travels curved paths, what is a straight line? Einstein said that it makes no sense to talk of straight lines. Space itself is curved. Not only space, but space-time. That means that space and time change as they move through gravitational fields. But how does that relate to Newtonian physics? In his laws of motion, Newton said a body moving in a straight line will keep moving in that straight line until it's acted upon by an outside force. If there are no straight lines, what is the meaning of the law of inertia? On a flat map or chart, the shortest path between two points is the familiar straight line that joins them, but not on the surface of a globe. Here, the shortest path between two points is not a straight line, but is a great circle. To generalize, the shortest path between any two points on any surface is called a geodesic. Einstein said that starlight may not really be bent by the gravitational force from the sun. Instead, it can be said to travel inertially along the shortest path between any two points in the local curved space-time. That makes it seem to bend to any observer. And for the same reason, the Earth's orbit doesn't have to be, as Newton said, a compromise between inertia, which makes the Earth want to fly off in a straight line, and the sun's gravity, which keeps the Earth circling the sun. Just like the light, the Earth can be said to move inertially, without any forces, along a geodesic and the local space-time created by the sun's presence. In other words, curved space-time or even just curved space, can create the appearance of a force even if there is none. Imagine two beings starting out on a journey, obeying the law of inertia. 
on what they think are two straight lines. But since they're on the surface of a sphere, they're really great circles. After a while, they start getting closer together, as if drawn by some mysterious force. They might even call that force gravity. Einstein did exactly the opposite. He eliminated the force of gravity. It can be replaced by the curvature of space-time. But Einstein now had created a mammoth dilemma. How does mass cause space-time to curve? He spent the most difficult seven years of his life, from 1909 to 1916, working on the riddle. And when he finished, he had produced nothing less than a new theory of the cosmos. It was a theory that was not designed to extend or expand Isaac Newton's mechanical universe. Instead, it was designed to replace it completely. But how could that be possible? Could it be that Newton's theory was wrong after all? Does the moon not fall 1 20th of an inch every second? Do planets not still sweep out equal areas in equal times? And when a spacecraft leaves the Earth, Who's driving? That's a good question. I think Isaac Newton's doing most of the driving right now. Of course, Newton's laws work just as well as they always have. In most places and most times, Newton's universe and Einstein's universe are so nearly identical that only the most precise instruments of science, stretched to the limits of their abilities, can detect the tiny differences. But there are times and places in the universe where conditions are so extreme that only Einstein's theory can explain them. For example, when a very large star, much larger than the sun, exhausts its nuclear fuel, it starts to collapse under its own gravity. Some of the mass is blasted away in a violent explosion, but with no force strong enough to oppose the collapse. The inward fall of the rest continues until gravity becomes so intense that space-time itself is stretched and warped into a point of infinite curvature called a black hole. Like an ordinary projectile falling back to Earth, light itself and absolutely anything else is drawn back by that awesome concentration of mass. It takes an immense amount of mass crowded into a tiny space to create a black hole. If black holes exist, they are either remnants of collapsed giant stars, or they may be primeval, left over from the Big Bang, the instant when the universe began. Of course, it's tantalizing to try to imagine what it would be like to be inside of a black hole. But we'll never know. That is the ultimate impossibility. Oh, you might arrange to fall into one if you really tried. <laughs> but then, even if you survived, there would be no way for you to let us know what you found once you got inside. But here is something to think about. When the universe was created in the Big Bang, it started to expand rapidly. Clumps of matter condensed into galaxies, but those galaxies are flying away from each other at great speed, even today. But that expansion does slow down with time. After all, the galaxies do attract each other by means of gravity. In fact, if the density of matter in the universe is high enough, that expansion will not continue forever. Someday, the universe will start contracting again it will become smaller and smaller, approaching another cataclysmic event, which is the exact reverse of the Big Bang. That event has a name in cosmology, too. It's called the Big Crunch. <laughs> now, we don't know if there's enough matter in the universe to cause that to happen. But let's suppose that there is. In that case, nothing will ever escape that contraction, not even light itself. But if nothing, not even light, can escape, why, that's exactly the way we describe the inside of a black hole. It's possible that we already are inside a black hole. It's possible that our entire universe is the inside 
of a black hole in somebody else's universe. Now, it seems to me that that's a big enough idea to keep you busy until the next time I see you. Einstein's general theory of relativity replaces gravity by the curvature of space-time. The more massive an object, the greater the curvature of space-time around an object. A black hole is an object for which space-time is so warped that nothing can escape from it. The time has come, the teacher said, to tie up many threads. How Tycho's claws and Kepler's laws just tore the Greeks to shreds. Why Einstein's space in Newton's place is loose in many heads. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org. Hi, I'm Alexander Samsel with more science news you can use. Why is the sky blue? Hey, sometimes the sky is red or orange or some other color. Why is that? I'll get to that. First, let's figure out why the sky is blue. The sun produces light containing all the colors of the rainbow. But all those colors combined produce white light, like the colors of the spinning circle. All the colors are still there, but mixed together, they appear white. So why is the sky blue or orange or whatever? Blue light waves are absorbed by the gases in the air and get scattered all over the sky. But as the sun sets, most of the blue light has been scattered by the time the light reaches you. What you see are the colors of the sunset. Until next time, I'm Alexander Samsel with more science news you can use. Annenberg Media. come to the end of this part of our journey. And I'd like to celebrate by playing some music for you. But this is no ordinary music. This is something quite extraordinary. Of course, Johannes Kepler 
was the one who found out how the universe works. And what he found out was that it's very complicated. The orbits of the planets are eccentric. The sun is off center. The planets speed up and slow down as they go around, and so on. Kepler couldn't help asking himself why the creator hadn't chosen a simpler design. And when he thought he found the answer, this is what he wrote. He said, the heavenly motions are nothing but a continuous song for several voices, a music which, through discord and tensions, through syncopations and cadenzas, progresses toward certain pre-designed six-voice cadences and thereby sets landmarks in the immeasurable flow of time. Twenty centuries earlier, the Pythagoreans had thought that the heavens were a perfectly tuned instrument whose music could be heard only by the ear of the master Pythagoras himself. But the idea of heavenly music is older than time itself. And it was this idea of the music of the spheres echoing down through the corridors of history that Kepler had seized upon. A simpler universe would have made boring music. The creator had made a subtle and complex composition that could go on almost forever without repeating itself. Kepler thought that he had seen into the mind of the creator. In fact, he often thought that. And he wrote down what he had seen in this book. Johannes Kepler, The Harmony of the Universe, published in 1619. And he put down in this book the music of the songs of each of the planets. And he challenged the musicians of his own time to play the celestial music. Well, apparently, the musicians of his time thought they had better things to do, and so Kepler never got to hear his own music. But in our time, two men, John Rogers and Willie Ruff of Yale University, have synthesized Kepler's music on a computer so that we can hear it. And that's the music I'm going to play for you. So we have the music of the spheres synthesized on a computer. Every single one of you is waiting for me to say that this is far out, but I'm not going to say it. Instead, I'll just play the music for you. Mercury, nearest planet to the sun. Venus and Earth, the sister planets, the second and third. Mars the striking red planet. Jupiter, largest planet in the solar system. Saturn, until recently ringed with mystery. Uranus, the first planet discovered in modern times. Neptune, the eighth planet from the sun. Pluto, the ninth and most distant planet from the sun. Before the written word, there were metaphysical connections between music and the heavenly bodies. Now, the sights and the sounds of the cosmos are linked for all to see and hear. Inspired by Hindemith's grand opera about Kepler, De Harmonie der Welt, Ruff and Rogers created a full nine-part harmony, the harmony of the universe. Listen carefully and hear the six tonal voices. Mercury, the highest pitched. Venus and Earth, constantly changing from major to minor chords. Mars, most distinctive, easy to pick out in the full harmony. Jupiter's song, deeper, baser baritone and much slower. Saturn, hardly more than a growl in the heavens. And as far as Kepler saw and heard. But listen to the rhythm section, the voices of the outer planets. Uranus, rapidly ticking. Then Neptune's steady beat. And finally, Pluto's bass drum, the foundation of the whole structure. This 
is the music of the spheres. And in one way or another, it's been listened to for a very, very long time. Around 600 years before Christ, Pythagoras of Samos walked the earth in search of her most profound mysteries. And with his Greek followers, the Pythagorean Brotherhood, he came across some amazing discoveries. Mathematical riches as valuable today as they were in the Golden Age. A theorem about squares on the sides of right triangles, for example, that was later used to calculate how far the moon falls each second. Pythagoreans also figured out that the odd numbers add up to the perfect squares. Above all, while listening to the heavens, to the music of the spheres, they discovered the laws of musical harmony on Earth. And for the next few thousand years, Western composers based their scores on the Pythagorean harmonies. Apparently, everyone was happy dancing to the same old tune, until, in the Renaissance, a Florentine musician played havoc with the status quo. This man wrote a book that was very critical of the influence of ancient Greek concepts on the music of his day. His name was Vincenzo Galilei, and his nature, intellectual and rebellious, was inherited by his son. Galileo Galilei grew up to be a scientist, a revolutionary Copernican despite the consequences. And in the process, he corresponded on the heavenly nature of things with the like-minded astronomer and mathematical genius named Johannes Kepler. Much has been made of Kepler's dazzling accomplishments, but perhaps his most far-reaching was the harmony of the worlds. In it, he not only heard the age-old music of the spheres, he set down its space-age sound on paper. Like his colleague Kepler and his father Vincenzo, Galileo himself had a thing or two to say about harmony. That is, about harmonic motion. Discovering that every swing of a pendulum took exactly the same amount of time. Galileo found not only the formula for making beautiful music, but he unlocked the secret of keeping perfect time. And he didn't stop there. When Galileo realized that a small rhythmically applied force could make oscillations grow to the limit, he knew he'd discovered something else about music, the principle of resonance. As an idea, resonance wasn't as dangerous as the ones for which Galileo was eventually brought to trial. But in its own way, resonance did, and still does, produce some shattering results. Can the amplified voice of Ella Fitzgerald shatter this glass? Believe it. If it can be said that Galileo and his father made careers of shattering Greek traditions of science and music, it should be acknowledged that every Western scholar made progress only by climbing those ancient foundations to begin with. By the same token, if Galileo was inspired by his father, perhaps so too was Pythagoras, whose father was a gem cutter. 
Even today, viewing the geometrical shapes of natural crystals, one can see them as facets of the mathematical nature of nature itself. Looking deeply into the nature of just about everything, Greek philosophers perceived that matter is made up of atoms. But it would take centuries to discover that the shape of matter would reflect the arrangement of atoms. An arrangement in which atoms are bound together by the electrical potential energies that act between them. And while interactions between atoms are electrical in nature, interactions between members of the human species can be just as complex and highly charged. As demonstrated by the bitter controversy between Baron Gottfried von Leibniz and Sir Isaac Newton. Among many other remarkable distinctions, Newton was Cambridge University's representative to the British Parliament. He was not England's greatest statesman, but when it came to the behavior of masses and forces, no one laid down the law better than he did. The change of motion, he proclaimed, is proportional to the force impressed and is made in the direction of the straight line in which the force is impressed. In other words, and in modern terms, force equals mass times acceleration, which is a vector equation. About the derivative of a derivative. With that equation, he found a power beyond the scope of politics and a glorious reason unequaled by any other scientific idea in history. In F equals MA, Isaac Newton found the means to upset the apple cart of the universe. And for the first time in several thousand years, the way to set it straight again. Newton's second law of motion explains the fall of a sphere in a viscous liquid and the descent of a penny and a feather in a vacuum. Newton's equation F equals MA explains the moon's falling motion through the vacuum called outer space and the falling motion of a star. This one caught as a charged drop of oil in the inner space of a scientific laboratory. Combined with his law of gravity, Newton's second law of motion gives the motion of every projectile on Earth, as well as every body in the heavens. In fact, when Newton realized that the falling moon obeys the same equation as a falling apple, united the physics of Earth with the physics of the heavens. And they were united, not only in the realm of equations, but also in the sphere of pure geometry. The path of any projectile on Earth, like the orbits of the planets in the heavens, is a conic section. It can be said, without hyperbole, that every projectile on Earth follows a parabola, and every planet traces out an ellipse. The similarity is hardly surprising, since all these motions obey the same equations. How in the world can one small equation be as powerful as the universe itself? For one thing, F equals MA applies to every force in the mechanical universe, whether it's the force of gravity on a falling body or the magnetic force between electric currents or the force of viscosity on a falling marble or the force of a spring on a bobbing mass. Not only does Newton's second law of motion apply to any force, 
it applies to any mass, no matter what and no matter where. Whether it's a bobbing mass or a pole vaulter. Let's go to right. A home run ball. Or a pool ball. But most important of all, the incredible power of F equals MA resides in the fact that it doesn't describe where a body is, nor how fast it moves. It describes how fast it gets faster. In other words, F equals MA is an equation about derivatives, and therein lies Newton's essential power and superiority. For example, an algebraic equation can give the precise trajectory of one particular cannonball. But F equals MA, because it's a differential equation, can give the trajectory of every projectile ever thrown or fired. But in the beginning, what was it that drove young Isaac Newton to create such a powerful method with which to express himself? Indeed, what set off the scientific revolution in the first place? As much as anything else, it was the revolutionary passion of an otherwise timid Polish monk, Nicholas Copernicus. Unlike Ptolemy's Aristotelian solar system, the Copernican universe no longer placed the Earth in the center of things. No longer was the Earth itself fixed and stationary, nor for that matter was anything else. Copernicus not only set the Earth into motion, spinning the academic world around in platonic circles, but he set the scientific imagination loose, free to challenge ancient assumptions. Progress didn't come easily, nor all at once. But after Copernicus, the world was an open book. Of course, with Galileo and all that intellectual freedom came responsibility. The responsibility to describe nature as it really is. And to do that required a new mathematics, the mathematics of motion. Of course, the ancient Greeks had found that the area of a circle was as easy as pi, and that was a move in the right direction. Archimedes found a formula for the area of a parabolic segment, and that was progress. But the mathematics of motion doesn't merely describe the shape of things to come. As advanced as it sounds, that sort of figuring was more or less exhausted in the Golden Age. So rather than describing something in fixed, old-world terms, the new mathematics derives the rate at which something changes, whether the rate at which a body falls or the rate at which a hill is on the rise. The derivative is a mathematical device that throughout the ever-changing universe of motion goes to the limit. But there's almost no limit to the number of functions that can be differentiated once a few simple rules have been stored away. And derivatives serve in another area as well. In fact, in the area of any region bounded by a smooth curve. Indeed, after Isaac Newton and Wilhelm Leibniz found the connection between integration and differentiation, between area and rate of change, the sky was the limit. However, even with the mathematics of change, some things are constant, as constant as human curiosity about what may or may not exist in outer space. Within the expanding nature of differential equations, the most constant thing is the constant itself.
In some cases, the constant merely shows how fast a projectile starts its journey. But other constants have a broader and more significant scope. For example, whether it's a common game of billiards, or a cosmic game of tag, whenever there's no outside force involved, momentum is constant. Momentum is mass times velocity. And the change of momentum can be expressed by a differential equation. Force is the rate of change of momentum. Of course, if there are no forces operating, the derivative is equal to zero. Therefore, the vector P is constant. In other words, when force is zero, momentum is conserved. And if R cross F is zero, something else is conserved. So what is R cross F the derivative of? If R cross F is zero, the quantity conserved is called the angular momentum. Whether it's the motion of a gyroscope, or the motion of a planet. If there's no twisting force, angular momentum is constant. And energy is constant, once the work is done. Whether large or small, work is force through distance. And it all adds up. Or in the language of calculus, it integrates. If work is done lifting a block from one height to another, it becomes the change in potential energy. If instead, work is done to accelerate the block, it becomes kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of a falling object may be transformed into another kind of kinetic energy, a form of energy called heat. Heat, which spreads from molecule to molecule, which dissipates the energy, but which never destroys it. Potential energy, U, kinetic energy, K, and heat, Q. Add them together, and the result is total energy, and forever constant. And it's energy, potential and kinetic, that ultimately determines the orbits of the planets. That symphony of perfect order, the harmony of the spheres. As Johannes Kepler wrote, the heavenly motions are nothing but a continuous song for several voices, to be perceived by the intellect, not by the ear. A music which through discordant tensions, through syncopations and cadenzas, as it were, progresses toward certain pre-designed six-voice cadences, and thereby sets landmarks in the immeasurable flow of time.
Well, we've been through a lot together. We've come from the dawn of history right down to physics as we know it today. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have to tell you about classical mechanics. Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org. Uh, the reason why I believe drive is so important to the teaching profession is you really have to love what you do in order to, to do it. Uh, we're confronted with so many different challenges, so many different uh, problems sometimes, uh, you know, in working with some of our students, that if you're not driven to keep at it, to keep working at it, then you can easily be discouraged. So that drive, that pers it, which is part of perseverance, is, uh, is crucial for this job. My choice, my Pinellas County Schools. space, first seen a mere three decades ago. Suddenly it was more stunning than we had ever imagined. We saw Earth as a planet as never before. It was a dramatic new view that marked the beginning of an unprecedented search to understand the dynamic forces that shape our world. In the desolate ice fields of Antarctica, Scientists hunt for fragments from space to find clues of Earth's origin. In the fiery cauldron of a Hawaiian volcano, they collect dangerous liquid rock that may reveal hidden mysteries of the Earth's interior. An oceanographer in space surveys a global sea far more turbulent than ever envisioned. The deep diving submersibles venture into the greatest frontier on Earth, to discover fantastic new worlds in the alien deep. We live in an extraordinary era of exploration. We have learned that Earth's surface is cracked and moving, and its continents drift relentlessly across the face of the planet. We have seen the unimaginable. Strange places where the seafloor is pulling apart and where new land is born from volcanoes under the sea. We have unlocked the history of Earth's climate to solve the riddle of its ice ages past and to glimpse what the future might hold. Our space probes have uncovered an invisible yet powerful energy driven by the sun whose impact we are just beginning to fathom. 
We have traveled to other worlds to find lost secrets of Earth's history. I wonder if life may have been shaped by collisions from outer space. Our Earth is a vast and complex system that has evolved over billions of years. Yet a new force may now influence its destiny. We stand on the threshold of a great adventure, equipped with a new generation of technology. We will probe the Earth and beyond for an even more dramatic look at the planet on which we live. Join us now in the first of a new seven-part exploration in the rediscovery of planet Earth. Major funding for this program is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Corporate funding for planet Earth is provided by IBM. IBM is proud to support the innovative spirit of scientific inquiry that made this series possible. For most of man's history, Earth was a frightening place. Strange, tortured landscapes inspired myth and legend. On the Pacific island of Hawaii, the volcano goddess Pele was believed to curse man by turning him to stone. Primitive people stood in awe of the magic forces surrounding them. volcano is but a small clue to the awesome power that forms the Earth's surface. It creates and destroys and creates again. Not until the middle of the 20th century did scientists arrive at the most comprehensive theory about the real forces that shape the Earth. It was a revolution in scientific thought called plate tectonics. From the discovery that the Earth's rigid outer shell is broken into huge moving plates, and from the Greek tecton, to build. In this new view of Earth, the seemingly permanent mountains, oceans, and continents are but the ephemeral manifestations of a continual cycle of creation and destruction. And today, the exploration continues. Jan? I'm Pete Palmer. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Looks like we've got a really great day ahead of us. Yeah, looks like a good one. Pete Palmer of the Geological Society of America takes us to one of the world's great natural geological laboratories, a place where many chapters of Earth history are revealed. The Grand Canyon. Ten miles across, 250 miles long, a mile deep. But more important, it is a story of vast changes over vast time. The Colorado River has exposed a spectacular window into the past. In the walls, we see the kinds of evidence that establish geology as a science, uh, evidence that the Earth has a long history, uh, that it can be understood if, if we just know the rules. And rock layers are like pages in a book. The horizontal layers preserve a record of seas and rivers and deserts. Pete Palmer descends ever deeper into the great time capsule of the canyon. Underneath those horizontal layers, uh, there's a tilted series that records an older record of seas and rivers and even some volcanoes. And beneath them, uh, there are contorted vertical layers that represent the guts of an ancient mountain system. Scientists can date each of these worlds because radioactive materials in the rock act as a kind of clock. The 
canyon records some two billion years of an Earth that has changed its surface many times. The Grand Canyon dramatically reveals that Earth is old and Earth is dynamic. Over time, whole worlds have been created and destroyed and created again. Just two centuries ago, these were radical ideas. Their acceptance began a major revolution in the scientific understanding of the Earth that continues today. The revolution began in Edinburgh, Scotland, some 200 years ago. In the late 1790s, the Industrial Revolution and the political revolutions in France and America were being felt around the world. This spirit of change inspired radical new ideas in science. In the dogma of the day, Earth was created by heavenly forces, and its surface shaped by the great flood of the book of Genesis. By counting lifetimes in the Bible, leading churchmen had pronounced that Earth was created precisely in the year 4004 BC, on October 26th, at nine in the morning. The Earth was a mere 6,000 years old. But 18th century Edinburgh was a source of intellectual ferment. Among the geniuses of the now famous Scottish Enlightenment was James Hutton, the father of geology. Hutton spent a lifetime puzzling over the earth. He would challenge, then change the dogma of his day. Sketches for Hutton's book document his keen observation of nature. Might the rock layers be different worlds, each with its own origin? Hutton scoured the crags of Scotland in search of clues that would tell how these worlds were formed. 18th century wisdom declared the Earth's landscape fixed and unchanging, but the extinct volcanoes surrounding Edinburgh aroused Hutton's skepticism. They suggested to Hutton a surface that was dynamic and constantly changing, driven by what he called the Earth's great heat engine. Gordon Craig is the James Hutton Professor of Geology at the University of Edinburgh. Here, on Edinburgh's ancient volcano, Arthur's Seat, and along the Salisbury Crags, he explores the rocks that told Hutton of a living Earth. Isn't it marvelous that Hutton should have this as his backyard, an old volcano? He used to walk here with his dog called Missy, and the detailed evidence that encouraged him in his theory of the Earth was right here. Because here you can see uh, evidence of rocks overlying each other. The prevailing view towards the end of the 18th century was that all rocks were laid down in water. Not so, so far as Hutton was concerned. Hutton believed that these rocks, actually, this particular rock, was intruded into pre-existing rocks. It was a molten liquid that had come up from below as part of a dynamic earth. But another radical idea, geologic time, was needed before this restless earth could be understood. Hutton wondered how long must it take to wear down a whole mountain? Built in 200 AD by the Roman army, Hadrian's Wall stretches from sea to sea across northern England. Erosion relentlessly destroys the landscape, but Hadrian's Wall hadn't changed much in 16 centuries. Hutton recognized that mountains must take millions of years to wear down, not centuries. That Earth must be far older than 6,000 years. Radioactive dating now suggests an age of 4.6 billion years, a million times older than thought in Hutton's day. When a mountain wears down and washes to the sea, the ground-up mountain forms flat layers of sand and mud. Here at Sicker Point, Hutton found one set of horizontal rock layers, but beneath these were others, tilted on their sides. What force could possibly bend solid rock in this way? Gordon Craig explains. I guess this must have been one of the most exciting localities Hutton had ever seen. 
he was in his 60s, it was probably his last geological excursion, and he came across really what was the essence of his whole theory of the Earth. Because here he realized that there were vertical rocks here which had once been horizontal sands and muds. They had been folded by immeasurably strong forces, they've been uplifted, they've been eroded, and on top, these much younger sediments have been laid down. This cyclicity of operation, of erosion and deposition, of old lands wearing away and new lands being formed, was the essence of his theory of the Earth, a dynamic Earth as we know it today. By asking how these vertical rock layers could have formed, Hutton made one of the great leaps in mankind's intellectual history. The rocks told a story of an Earth that was both ancient and dynamic. In his words, with no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. The theologian's 6,000 years became but a single tick of the geologist's clock. Our view of Earth would never be the same. In the century that followed, scientists would explore further than ever before. German scientist Alfred Wegener was at the vanguard. Rare footage of his final expedition to the icy heart of Greenland in 1930 still speaks of a time when much was to be learned in the far reaches of the Earth. Science here was a struggle against the deadly powers of nature. These rigorous expeditions would enlarge Wegener's curiosity about the Earth. Wegener conducted many meteorological experiments, but he was curious about more than weather. He was puzzled by glacial deposits in the tropics, by identical fossils on continents thousands of miles apart, by mountain ranges with the exact same geology, but separated by vast oceans. His curiosity drove him to seek an imaginative solution to these scientific puzzles. Like Greenland's sea ice, perhaps continents could also split and move apart. Wegener's bold leap was to reconstruct a world where the continents fit together. His sketches connected broken mountain chains and solved other unanswered problems. This single giant continent is called Pangaea, all lands. Though based on careful scientific reasoning, Wegener's ideas were dismissed as fantasy by scientists of his day. No force could possibly plow whole continents through the bedrock of the ocean bottom. Wegener died in Greenland lost in the far reaches of a frozen wilderness. But his vision of moving continents would haunt the scientific world until new discoveries at the bottom of the sea revived his challenging ideas. In mid-century, global research, highlighted by the International Geophysical Year of 1957-58, provided new ways of looking at the Earth as a planet. Spurred by this global view, scientists would explore and map the ocean floor and collect data that would lead to the discovery of an Earth far more dynamic than ever envisioned. In the mid-Atlantic, scientists would discover a mountain range that mirrored the coastlines with summits reaching 10,000 feet above the ocean floor. The mountains wind 46,000 miles around the globe like the seam on a giant baseball. Split by a central rift valley and rocked by countless earthquakes, no scientific theory could account for these curious phenomena. For centuries, scientists thought the ocean floor was part of the original crust of the Earth, frozen in time when the planet cooled from a molten ball. But dredging brought up relatively young rocks and newly created volcanic lava. Surprisingly, no rocks were older than 150 million years. Sediment corers were plunged to the ocean bottom. Scientists expected the cores to read like an encyclopedia of the past, but billions of years were missing. Some 95% of Earth history was gone. Where did that history go? 
Why was the ocean floor so very young? In 1960, Princeton professor Harry Hess proposed an idea later called seafloor spreading. He supposed that molten rock rising in the deep valleys of these undersea mountains formed new seafloor and spread to each side as more new rock came from below. If so, an entire ocean floor could be created in one to 200 million years, a mere 5% of Earth's history. But lacking hard evidence, Hess called his idea geopoetry. Ironically, supporting evidence for seafloor spreading would be found on land, at the site of an ancient volcanic eruption. Here in the Owens Valley of California, scientists probing one mystery would serendipitously provide a way to measure the growth of the ocean floors. When lava cools, it acts like a compass, freezing in the direction of magnetic north. But in several locations around the world, frozen compasses were discovered that pointed south. What did it mean? Do rocks somehow reverse their magnetism? Or more fantastically, can the Earth's magnetic field change direction? Since 1956, Alan Cox of Stanford University and Brent Dalrymple of the U.S. Geological Survey have explored this magnetic reversal mystery. Our idea was to collect rock samples from all over the world. We would look at their mineral content, the direction in which they were magnetized, and their ages, and compare these. If rocks were magnetized to the south because they contained peculiar minerals, then all rocks magnetized to the south contain those peculiar minerals. On the other hand, if the wild theory that the magnetic field had flipped was correct, we'd find that rocks from all over the world recorded this flip at exactly the same time. Now, I'll see what I can find here. For accurate testing, the scientists must find lava undisturbed since the eruption. A diamond drill is used to obtain cores of lava. Back in the laboratory, they are dated and carefully measured to determine whether they are magnetized to the north or south. Good, thanks, Brent. I'll shoot that. Uh... Before the core is removed, Cox takes a careful note of its orientation by using a compass to sight on a known landmark in the nearby Sierra Nevada mountains. Azimuth. Such precision is necessary to later accurately determine the lava's magnetic direction. Y-axis is 281. This looks like a pretty good place to set up the fuckscape, right? The frozen lava compasses here at Big Pine, California, reveal that the Earth's magnetic field did actually flip to the south almost a million years ago. Cores drilled here and around the world resulted in a time scale of magnetic reversals that plotted these flips. By 1966, Cox's group would confirm nine north-south flips in some four million years. But amazing as this discovery was, no one could know it would also unlock a rich and dynamic Earth history. Research vessels had been towing magnetometers across the oceans. Here, over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the readings revealed strange and mysterious magnetic patterns. But no one knew what they meant. The key to deciphering these curious patterns would come from another team of scientists at England's historic Cambridge University. People often assume that well, we sort of had the idea in the bath or while shaving. Well, not collectively, but one of us had the idea in the bath or while shaving. Frederick Vine, a young student, would team with Drummond Matthews to analyze a detailed magnetic survey Matthews made in the Indian Ocean. Made in, what, 62? Which I brought back from sea in 62, yes. Which she brought back, yeah, just a few months after I started as a graduate student and basically gave me the job of interpreting that. After studying the strange seafloor patterns, both scientists reached a startling conclusion. At mid-ocean ridges, hot rock surges upward, cools, and is slowly carried away as if riding a giant conveyor belt. 
Vine and Matthews theorized that newly created seafloor, like volcanoes on land, records the direction of the prevailing magnetic field and leaves a matching pattern on each side of the ridge. The remarkable match of the magnetic patterns on the seafloor, stripe for stripe, with the magnetic time scale developed on land, established the concept of seafloor spreading and also the rate at which the plates are moving apart. 1968, a specially equipped research vessel, the Glomar Challenger, is dispatched to the South Atlantic. It drills sample cores on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Analysis of rock and marine fossils brought to the surface shows that the seafloor grows progressively older the farther it is away from the ridge. Glomar's drilling would provide the first direct confirmation of seafloor spreading, nearly an inch a year. Geopoetry had seemingly become geofact. 400 miles southwest of the Azores, scientists prepare for an extraordinary adventure. The French submersibles, Siena and Archimed, with America's Alvin, will give scientists a first-hand look at a site of seafloor spreading. Dubbed Project Famous, the expedition into the deep began four years after man landed on the moon. Alvin sinks for two miles into a rift valley the size of the Grand Canyon. The scientists film seafloor cracks, evidence that the plates are pulling apart. Distinctive formations called pillows demonstrate that volcanic eruptions from below create new seafloor, similar to this pillow lava forming off the coast of Hawaii. The fires of creation burn under the sea. As this new lava and the rocks beneath it cool, they thicken to some 60 miles, forming the outer shell of the globe, called the lithosphere. Numerous shallow earthquakes are recorded along these mid-ocean ridges, still deeper ones at edges of some continents and under high mountains like the Andes and the Himalayas. These earthquakes reveal the lithosphere is fractured like a giant eggshell into some 20 huge slabs or plates. Here, the African plate, the Indian-Australia plate, the Pacific plate. This lava lake is analogous to how these plates float on a partially molten layer beneath the lithosphere. The continents don't plow through hard ocean floor, as Wegener's critics claimed, but ride like passengers embedded in these floating rafts. As they jostle for position, the plates interact in four ways. Some spread apart at mid-ocean ridges. Some grind past each other. Those carrying continents collide. Some slide beneath each other. This ceaseless movement builds the Earth's surface. As a result, the continents have been in very different places much as Alfred Wegener's supercontinent Pangaea depicts. The face of Earth was once as different from our planet today as it will be in the distant future. It is this movement of Earth's great plates that constantly rebuilds Earth's surface and provides a powerful tool for understanding many of its great mysteries. It explains why Antarctica was once tropical and the Sahara Desert buried beneath an ice cap. Antarctica was once at the equator, and the Sahara where Antarctica is now. And so the search continues, uncovering knowledge about our own world we had never suspected. And as we continue, new technologies, pushed by the human imagination, will reveal even more about our living machine.
Major funding for this program is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Corporate funding for planet Earth is provided by IBM. Join us for the next episode as scientists continue to unfold the story of our remarkable planet. To learn more about the Annenberg CPB Channel series and workshops for teachers, how to take them for credit, how to buy them on video cassette, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org slash channel. The Annenberg CPB Channel. of our world, the fires of creation burn. As this new lava and the rocks beneath it cool, they thicken to some 60 miles, forming the outer shell of the globe, called the lithosphere. Numerous shallow earthquakes are recorded along these mid-ocean ridges, still deeper ones at the edges of some continents. These earthquakes reveal that the lithosphere is fractured like a giant eggshell into some 20 huge slabs or plates. Here, the African plate, the Indian-Australia plate, the Pacific plate. This lava lake is analogous to how these plates float on a partially molten layer beneath the lithosphere. As they jostle for position, the plates spread apart at mid-ocean ridges, grind past each other or slide beneath each other. Those carrying continents collide. This ceaseless movement rearranges our world and makes it the living machine. Funding for this program is provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. Corporate funding for planet Earth is provided by IBM. IBM is proud to support the innovative spirit of scientific inquiry that made this series possible. When we view the seemingly immutable mountains and canyons that surround us, it is hard to believe that the planet we live on is in constant flux. Yet Earth's surface is broken into many huge sections that move and shift. For those who live on plate edges, the results can be devastating. This extraordinary film of an earthquake in Japan was captured in May 1983. Tectonic drama begins in the five mile deep ocean trenches that ring the Western Pacific. Here, the westward moving Pacific plate sinks beneath Asia, beginning a complex and violent journey back into the hot interior, a process called subduction. As a result, Japan is one of the most earthquake riddled places in the world, coping with alien forces that invade at will. 
Tokyo alone has been devastated nearly once a century for the past 2,000 years. Japan has been called a land of living volcanoes. Its history, a chronicle of tragedy. Yet its people seem to know that their land owes its existence to volcanoes. With stoic resolve, their life goes on, as the Japanese have learned to live with this endless cycle of plate tectonic destruction and rebirth. Along the southern edge of the Asian mainland are India and the Tibetan Plateau, punctuated by the Himalaya Mountains. Here, 29,000 feet above sea level, fossils of ancient marine life are preserved in the rocks. They tell the remarkable story of another plate boundary where continents collide. More than 40 million years ago, the northward movement of the plate carrying India crashed into Asia and the Himalayas were born. So intense is the collision that even as far north as China, thousands of miles inland, the Asian continent is being pushed aside, creating powerful unseen forces that can strike without warning. A dramatic example of this came on the morning of July 28, 1976, in the Chinese city of Tangshan. Ravaged by a colossal earthquake, 20 square miles of the city collapsed in total ruin. As many as three quarters of a million people died in a tragic and dramatic display of plate tectonics. Another kind of plate edge is marked by the San Andreas Fault on the coast of California. Here, the Pacific plate moves violently past the North American plate. April 18th, 1906. In a single minute, the Pacific plate lurched 20 feet northward along the fault releasing energy that had been building for a century. The earthquake and resulting fires destroyed much of San Francisco. 